God bless you all once again and welcome this morning. In terms of a church as LFC here in London, we began a series in December actually last year, just looking prophetically into 2021. I felt God clearly spoke to me one day about taking the limits off and I was quite surprised with that word. It's a word that comes from Psalm 74, where God was um, admonishing the people of Israel and saying, you're limiting me. And I'd never had that concept before of how I as a human being could limit God. God wants to do something good and I'm stopping him. Are you kidding me? So I had to do research and I realized that in immense ways, I, I, I'm limiting a good God. I'm harming myself. How? Well, my image of God, as I believe, so shall I receive. So if I'm not studying the God of Scripture, if I'm letting the world tell me who God is, or my friends tell me who God is, as it were, I need to see the God of Scripture, the real God, the good God, the God who's good all the time. I need to find this God, the true God. And when I see him, as I believe, so shall I receive. My image of myself, my self-image. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. And the way I think about myself can limit me. We were like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And so we were. And we saw in our first week of looking prophetically at this year that we embrace, Father, help us this year to not limit you. Can you say amen? Father, help us this year to not put any limitations by, by our belief system, by our, our self-image, by what we do, by how we behave. Help us enter into this. It's almost like a promise. It's a prophetic invitation. Let's enter in in Jesus' name. <clears throat> in the second week, that was last week or the week before, was it? God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Very deep issue. And no wonder people get confused. No wonder they get confused. God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and there's a lion in the garden. <laughs> daddy, daddy, there's a lion. What? Satan was in the garden. Satan's in the garden. What father takes his children, puts them in a garden and lets a lion loose? You know, Satan's described as a lion who comes to kill, rob, and destroy. And very confusing when you look at that, you know, even from a secular perspective. But if you look more closely, you realize that's not what happened at all. God gave Adam total authority. Adam had authority. So that lion was totally caged. It wasn't God who loosed the lion. It was Adam. Adam let the lion loose. Adam cooperated and gave them the authority. And then Jesus, in his goodness, comes to clean up the mess that Adam made. So in our second week, we looked at God's sovereignty and man's responsibility for sin and all that we see in the disasters in this world and God's goodness in resolving the issues that we face every day and the suffering and the pain God will one day be totally vindicated. In this third week, the title of today's message is God's Sovereignty and the Believer's Authority. God's Sovereignty and the Believer's Authority. And I want to start off by putting the authority I'm talking about in some context, okay? I'm talking about spiritual authority. You're born again. Well, many of you are. Not all of you will be, but many of you are. When you're born again. Your spirit is alive. And the authority I'm talking about is a supernatural authority. It's a heavenly thing. I am seated in the heavenly realms with Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and earth is in the hands of Jesus. The, the, the authority I'm talking about is a spiritual authority. And I want you to become accustomed with that. Many Christians can be very secular, very carnal. I don't mean sinful, I just mean carnal, natural, shall we say. Other Christians can be hyper-spiritual. <laughs> so everything's spiritual. They see demons behind every bush, you know, that sort of thing. These two extremes are both very unhealthy, very unhealthy. Not everything is spiritual. 
Not everything is carnal. And right there in the middle is a balanced place where we should be. Some Christians, you know, they, they struggle to believe in anything spiritual, struggle to believe in demons, but the Bible says you do not fight against flesh and blood. You don't fight against flesh and blood. You fight against principalities and powers. Now, how are you going to do that if you're not aware of your spiritual authority? You can't do it in your flesh. That's a disaster. So don't be an extremist. Don't be everything's spirit, because it's not. There's a natural world here also. And don't be everything's carnal, because it's not. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities and powers. And anyway, most of the miracles that Jesus worked, he attributed to a spiritual demonic origin. Do you know that? I'll say it again. Most of the miracles that Jesus worked, he directly named them as having a spiritual origin. For example, there was a woman who had curvature of the spine. Do you ever see someone like that? Where they're doubled in two. I had a friend like that once. Very sad sight when you see someone walking and they're completely bent over. And this woman walking around. Now, you see, some Christians would look and you could say, well, this is the devil. Some Christians, oh, all spirit, 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 right? But when Jesus saw that woman, he pointed at her and he said this, this woman who Satan bound, this woman who Satan bound, Jesus immediately attributed her physical sickness to a spiritual origin. So be careful. You have been given, if you're born again, the access to great spiritual authority. Great spiritual authority. But if you continue in carnality and don't achieve what I, I, I would consider a biblical balance, you'll never exercise that. You'll never understand it. And then we don't complete the task. Another example, Mark chapter 9, verse 17. I love this. Someone in the crowd replied, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a spirit that makes him mute. Now, how are you going to behave if you approach someone who's mute? In this case, they came to Jesus and they said, it's a spirit that's making him mute. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground and he foams at the mouth, he gnashes his teeth and he becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. Maybe they were a bit carnal, huh? I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they didn't seem to have access to the spiritual authority. So they brought the man to Jesus. Listen to this. As soon as seeing Jesus, the spirit immediately threw the man to the ground. Wow. Okay, let me tell you something. I was invited to go and pray for a man who was like this. A man who was throwing himself around in great fits of, and, you know, of uh, losing control and pray for him. People felt he was oppressed by demons or whatever. Will you go and see him? So I went to see him. Now, I knew this guy from before when he was free. When he was free. So when I approached him, I will remember this for the rest of my life. When I approached him, I saw him about 100 feet away from me. And I looked at him and he looked at me and I said, Hiya! Do you know what that man did? He hurled himself straight into a wall. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, oh. The, the noise of that thump would just rings in my head. It rings in my ears. It was so strong. And look at this scripture. Someone in the crowd replied, Jesus, I brought you my son who has a spirit that makes him mute. Whenever it sees him, seizes him, it throws him to the ground. And Jesus immediately he comes and he drives out the spirit. And later in other situations, he rebukes the, the apostles and the disciples for not taking their authority seriously enough. So no, not everything's spiritual and not everything's carnal. And the job of those who are born again, who are trusted with this authority, is to know when and how to use it in Jesus' name. God, would you give us that wisdom? Give us the wisdom to see with, with, with spiritual eyes. Help us, Father, in Jesus' name. Let me say a few things about authority. Spiritual authority. You have to enforce it. You have to enforce it. 
You know, I was walking here in Camden <coughs> this week and I lost count of the number of police cars back and forth, ER, 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 back all day. That's the police force. <laughs> the police force. It's called the force for a reason. Because if you take the force away, humanity will just go crazy. And the authority that we have as believers, it needs to be enforced. It needs to be used. Another thing about your authority, the authority that Jesus gives you will always be challenged. That's the one sure sign that you've got authority. Once people begin challenging you, that you will know that the authority of God is active. They challenge Jesus every day. If nobody ever challenges you, my friend, sorry, but you're probably not moving in spiritual authority. They challenge Jesus. They challenge the apostles and they will challenge you as soon as you know who you are. And by the way, they will challenge you when you say no. They will never challenge you when you say yes. Everybody likes yes, right? The world likes yes, yes man. But the word no is what gets severely, severely challenged. And I challenge you this morning to enter into the spiritual authority that God has got for you. But in some ways for me, this authority doesn't so much begin with God. Even more so it begins amongst my family and my authorities my father my mother as a child i need to obey my parents when i'm in a church i need to obey my pastors i need to obey the laws of the land and if it's some ways it starts there i'll explain that on another occasion whoever claims to love god yet hates his brother and sister is a liar for whoever does not love their brother and sister who may have seen how can they love God who they have not seen? And I would take that scripture today. If I don't obey my parents and then I say I'm obeying God, if I don't obey the, my, 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 my church leadership and then I say I'm obeying God, I'm a liar. You see? So it's very important that we get a working understanding of authority because you've got it and God wants you to use it and the world needs you to use it. The world needs us. London needs us. The nations need us. But they need us to be functioning the way Jesus intended us to function. And that needs a working knowledge of authority. Let me get a little bit personal here. I haven't been in London very long. We do an annual event called Easter Family Camp. It's quite a big event. There's three or four hundred people there. <coughs> it's over three days. And the first time I came to one of these events... My, my first ever experience of it one of our members here called Sandra she was organizing that year and I was away I was tired I was traveling on an international flight and I was landed back into London and she sent me like 50 sheets <laughs> of planning for Easter camp you know and said pastor can can you approve these sheets I thought oh lord and as I looked at the sheets if you're a parent you know things your kids don't know is that right or wrong? If you're a parent, you know things your kids don't know. When you're a pastor, you know many things that your members don't know. And today you know many things that your kids probably will never know. And I was tired. I don't know who Sandra is. I've seen her on Sunday sometime, but we didn't really know each other. And that was one of our first meetings. And I come in here and all the sheets are laid out on a table here. And I, I don't know her. But you know, I'm just being honest here. <laughs> Do you know what I was thinking in my head? I saw the plan. And there's certain things she doesn't know. So I can't have this person. I can't have that. And I can't have that. But you know what? I'm tired. I'm tired. And I, as I arrived to that meeting, that planning meeting, do you know what was going through my head? I hope this girl understands authority. Because I haven't got the energy to explain to you my decisions. Do you understand that? I haven't got the energy and I haven't got the time. So either you're going to understand authority or you and I are not going to be working together very long. So we sat down and she said, have you had a chance to look at the?" Yes, I've had a chance to look at it. Is everything okay? I said, no, everything's not okay. You see this here? We can't do it. Do you know what she did? She leaned over, see that person? I can't have them do that. She took a pen, put a line through the name and said, I'll find someone else. Anything else? 
I said, see this thing here, the way you've got that? I can't let that happen. Okay. Anything else? I said, see this? I can't have that. Anything else? I said, no. Okay. And then we move straight on. Hallelujah! <laughs> Praise the Lord! Someone who understands authority. Do you know, do you know the word that was missing? Why? 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 I remember Stephen and Simran. This is very personal today, isn't it? I remember Stephen and Simran. Again, in my first year here in LFC, Stephen and Simran came in on the Saturday and they did this rehearsal for a special. That's two of our worship team, by the way. So we're going to sing this special song. So they did the, the worship team practice. Then they did their song practice for their special. Then they come in on Sunday morning. They do the worship practice. Then they do their extra special, special practice for my special. And then the worship starts. And we get to the end of the worship and it's time for their thing. The trouble was I couldn't do it that day. I couldn't do it. I felt God speak to me to change the structure. So I just intervened. I have no hesitation in doing those things. I just called Johanny, who's our worship leader. I called her over and said, we're not doing Stephen's thing today, Stephen and Simran. Tell them it's off. We'll do it some other time when we get the chance. So Johanny walks, I'm watching Johanny. She walks over to Stephen. She goes, you know, you know how it is. <laughs> and I was watching Stephen. I was watching his reaction. It's interesting because you don't know people until you say no. You don't know if he's mature. I don't know if he's immature. I don't know what he's like until I say no. So just out of interest, I just watch his reaction. Absolutely no reaction. He took the microphone, put it back in the stand. He sat down, got his Bible, got his pen and waited like a weaned child, the Bible would say. Waited for the word. My relationship with Stephen did not change one jot. He was exactly the same in his attitude, exactly the same in his relationship. It was like nothing ever happened. Amen. Your maturity in terms of walking in true spiritual authority is only seen with the word no. That's the only way we ever know who you are. And then that sets the level that you're at now. And that can only be adjusted when you cook better. Now, let me add this. The word why is very important. And there's a proper place to use it. It's, va it's a very, very important word for me as a pastor. Many times I have to ask why. Many times. It's part of life and it's good. But the word why sometimes is very questionable. The motivation in, in why, the motivation is wrong. And the word why also sometimes is downright rebellious. If I work for Tesco's and the manager says, pack that shelf, and I say, why? That's not, you're not, you're not going to be working Tesco's very long. If I'm in the army and the general says, march, and I say, why? You're out of the army, my friend. And yet we become abusive in church. You know what the disciples said to Jesus? Why do you want to wash my feet? Why are we going to Jerusalem? Why do you need to die? But the word why, in case of Peter, for example, it starts with the word why and it ends up with a sword cutting somebody's ear off. You should have just accepted the boss's advice, huh? So it begins with questioning, but it can end in, in a bad place. This for me is very, very important. You know, my children, they ask me why. Sometimes I ask it to answer the question, but sometimes I realize there's no point in even trying to explain to you. You're five years old. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's times when my children ask a question. Of course I will answer the question. But there's other times that it's not appropriate. John chapter 16, verse 12, Jesus said this. I have so much more to say to you, but you can't take it right now. I have much to say, but you can't bear it. So I'm not going to say it now. So for me, authority begins with me being submissive to my parents. And there's blessing with that. Me being submissive to the church that I've been in, which I've been in nearly 30 years now. 
and understanding that. I worked for Rick Seward for 20 odd years. Once in a blue moon, I tell you, once in a blue moon, that man would tell me why. Virtually never. <clears throat> we would get instruction and that's it. Well, every now and again, maybe three or four years would go by without me knowing why about anything. And that's what it is to be a soldier. That's what it is to be in an army. This questioning attitude is keeping some of you out. It's limiting you. It's limitations on you. Self-imposed limitations. I believe in questioning, but not rebellion. The authority, spiritual authority must be enforced. Spiritual authority will always be challenged. Guaranteed. And by the way, Satan's only tool against you is deception anyway. He's a deceiver. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus Christ. And in that sense, he's a total fake. I ran a drop-in center for drug addicts and prostitutes in Dublin. It was a very effective place. And in my first six months or so, we used to get somewhere between 20 and 50 uh, people in a day. And they were in bad states, many of them sleeping on the streets. And they were in a bad state, many of them. But we linked up with Teen Challenge, which is the world's biggest drug organization, drug rehab. So we would offer these places, the, the, these people, rehabilitation programs. And the, the Teen Challenge guys used to come all the time to our church and take the people away so <coughs> excuse me i would have people waiting who would come and would be planning you know and in the in the first year i remember one day everybody's in the room and i've got a couple of guys ready to go to rehab and i know all the policemen in the area i've introduced myself i've got a good relationship with the policemen and this day these two new policemen who i don't know i don't know these guys these two new policemen walked into the church and they took one you guy come with me and they took one of the heroin users outside you see they took him off and I, I wanted to work with him hey 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 what's going on but I didn't do anything I don't know I don't they're the police they've got authority in this place you know and one of the other addicts came over to me and he said Mike they have no authority to do that I said, of course they do. No, they don't. Number one, they can't be in your building unless you invite them. You have the authority to put them out. Yeah, yeah. Unless they've got a warrant. You can put them out. They have no authority to be in here. Another thing, what reason were they taking him? Were they taking him and why? What was the justification? And then I thought about that for a while. I thought, okay. And then as I investigated it in this time in Ireland, as it was, that's exactly how the law was. I did have authority over my building. I could put people out without any explanation. And so, lo and behold, you'll never guess what happened. A few weeks go by, the same two cops came in. And by the way, please, don't hear what I'm not saying. Obey the police force. I believe in that. Obey the laws of the land. I'm making another point, so don't get pedantic with me. The, the same two cops came in. And they go to take another guy. But I've got a plan for this man. And I, it was frightening for me, but I actually stood up and I said, excuse me, excuse me, could you just step outside, please? And I, I was shaking, you know, <laughs> I've never done this before. And they, they looked at me. I said, could you please just step outside, please? I, you know, who we, I, I'm the pastor here. Can you step outside the building, please? So we went outside and I just started talking. See that man? I've got a plan for him. I know who he is. He's going to a rehab. I know your boss, Sergeant Phil. He's a friend of mine. I'm working in this area. Who are you? And what's this? What are you doing? Do you know those cops? They didn't open their mouth. They didn't say a single word. They just stood silent and slowly walked away. And I'm thinking, well, why did you come in? To you were deceiving me. You know the law. You knew that you couldn't just walk in there and take that man out. You know the law, but I don't. I don't. I didn't know the authority that I have. And I repeat, please obey the police. Don't take me the wrong way. But it's a great example to me. You have authority. You know those cops? Do you know what their weapon was against me? Confidence. Confidence trick. They walk in, chest out, as if they're in charge of me. As if they're in charge of the place. And that's what it's like with the devil and with Jesus. They would confront him. 
If you intend to move in spiritual authority, many confident people will confront you. They will challenge you. Don't be fooled by that. Don't be fooled by it. You'll be challenged on your left and challenged on your right. And thank God for that simple man who knew the law. And thank God for some Christians who know the authority that they have. How do we receive this authority? <clears throat> if you're born again, great, great spiritual authority is available to you. But how do I receive it? You need to be sent. You need to be sent. Jesus had authority in the world because he was sent, commissioned. And then he says to us, he says this, as the Father sent me, so, in the same way, I'm sending you. As the Father sent me and gave me authority, now I am sending you. He's giving us that. And this is a critical point. That I come to Christ and I come under the, the, the shadow of his cover. Because here is my authority. Wonderful. And Jesus lived, walked, worked miracles under the shadow of God his Father. Under the shadow of the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Who or what overshadows you? Who? Do you know that the, the shadow of God, the beam of God upon the Apostle Peter was so strong that even the shadow of Peter, even when the shadow of Peter passed over, those who were sick, bang, they were healed because the power from God on high was coming through him. God was making a statement. You need to live under the shadow of your God. Hallelujah. Jesus had authority because he was sent and he lived under the shadow of the Most High, under the cover of his wings. Who or what is overshadowing you? It should be evidenced and if it's God, he will shine straight through me. I need to be transparent that the light of God and the power of God reaches humanity and we see healing and salvation. But the darkness in us can be stronger than that. And God forgive us for that. May we decrease. So that he can increase. Where does my authority come from? It comes when I'm sent. As the father sent me. So now I'm sending you. Secondly. The second part of covering. is not just God. It's also men. It's also the church. It's not as easy to say. Oh well, I'm just under God's cover. It just doesn't work like that. Yes, I'm under God's cover, but I'm also under human beings. When Adam gave, when God, <coughs> when God gave Adam authority in the Garden of Eden, he gave man authority over man. That's right. <laughs> there are people who have authority over me. There are human beings. And that's very, 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 very important. He sent them out two by two. Much of the New Testament is dedicated to, to educating me and you on the nature and the authority of the church. And I have to be under authority to exercise that authority. For me, this is an incredibly serious issue, very serious issue. And I've sacrificed many things in order to function under proper authority uh, and, and, and obedience. Even when I don't agree, you know, many, many times I don't agree. It's not important. Important thing is to stay under good, proper shadow. I need to be overshadowed. I need to be covered in my life and my ministry. So I've got authority because I'm sent. As the Father sent Jesus, so Jesus sends me. I've got authority because I'm under cover. But this authority works with five basic in five basic ways. Through the Holy Spirit, through the power of God's word, through the name of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, and through agreement. Don't worry, I'll send you notes later. The authority that I have... Look, okay, listen carefully, right? Listen to this. Jesus is not healing anybody today. Jesus, the last person Jesus healed was a couple of thousand years back. Jesus doesn't heal people today. That's the church's job. That's your job. How do we do it? Through the power of the Holy Spirit through belief and trust and the declaration of God's word, 
we pronounce healing in the name of Jesus through the power of his blood in the agreement within the church this is the instruction of Jesus as the father sent me to do these healings he sent me an authority now I've lost my body my physical body I'm going back to the father that that's yours now <laughs> right you know I hope this is not too technical but it's incredibly important Adam had authority in the garden because he had a body and Jesus had to come in a body to take that authority listen carefully then when Jesus died was resurrected where's the body for authority the church is the body the church is the body we are the functioning body of Christ the authority is upon you the authority is in us it's called the Adamic covenant it means he will not break that he will not break the word that goes out of his mouth and God made a covenant in the Garden of Eden with Adam, spirit, soul, and body. And he's so committed to never breaking his word. So bonded to that. You know, if God broke his word, the whole thing would fall apart. There would be nothing left. This universe is held together by the power of God's word. That's what it says. So we have the authority in the earth now. Can you imagine the sheer frustration in God? Does God get frustrated? I don't know. I mean, he must be looking at us thinking why don't you use the authority I gave you I gave you the Holy Spirit I gave you the Word of God I gave you the name of Jesus I gave you my own blood I gave you my blood now agree with one another and release the power that I sent you go and heal the sick go and raise the dead number four you need to accept your identity <clears throat> accept your identity in Christ the person that God has made you to be and I don't want to hurt anybody here I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings that's not my job but as I observe the life of Christians many Christians are getting their identity from their possessions their titles their qualifications their house their car their clothes their looks and they feel so much attracted to these things to your identity is in the heavenly place in Christ Jesus you have been seated with Christ and the evidence the evidence that you don't fully get that is because you're trying to get identity down here with these weak temporary things your identity is greater than all of this and it's a price a high price has been paid to give you that identity so take the limitations off your mind about who you are and your identity fifthly in order for me to exercise authority <coughs> <coughs> properly on the earth it's very important I remain in a good spirit you can have authority and you can misuse it in a bad spirit this is what the apostles remember one day when there was crowds giving Jesus trouble and the apostles turned around and said ha ha ha, ha. Oh, we've got we, we've got power and the apostles turned to Jesus Jesus shall we call down fire shall we burn them alive like Elijah did hey okay. authority they've got new authority now let's burn people with it and Jesus turns to them and says stop it you don't know what spirit you're off you don't know what spirit you're off so yes God gives us authority but you must be well careful to use that authority in a good spirit walk in the spirit of the law is the way I would put it but I don't want you to misinterpret that that's what Jesus did walking in the spirit of God's word walking in the spirit of God's law which is full of grace and truth so be very careful sometimes these things are buried deep inside us you know I've got to be under authority to have authority and I have one woman and I like this woman very much she was with me very great assistant and help to me for many years she was always in church never missed Sunday never missed a prayer meeting hard worker totally obedient never did anything wrong one of the most obedient people I've ever had ever never had to correct her on anything and I liked her but there's a problem <laughs> funny that isn't it 
and some, you just have to wait. I have to wait for my moment to give you the word. Can't give it to you too early. You have to wait until you're ready for it. One day, strange thing, walked in the church and everybody's having coffee. I think they couldn't even see her. It's not like God made her invisible. She was sitting at the back and she was crying. And these people love her, you know. I think God hid her for me to see. And I ran over and what's wrong? What's wrong? And she, she looked at me, you know, and she said, what's wrong with me? <laughs> what's wrong with me? And this was my moment. I got my moment. I sat down. I said, do you know what's wrong with you? <laughs> You're rebellious. You have a spirit of rebellion. And I could see her thinking, I never missed a Sunday, I never missed a prayer meeting, I've never disobeyed you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those actions are an overcompensation for what you know is wrong. That's what they are. Your Shakespeare said, Methinks the lady doth protest too much. Very good. You're overcompensating for a, what's actually a spirit. You're trying to deal with the spirit in carnal ways. Hello? You're trying to deal with a spiritual issue, with overcompensation. That's actually works, by the way. And works don't work. What you need is you need to repent, pray, and have probably deliverance. And then your authority can be properly restored in a good spirit. Amen? I'm going to... Uh, my, my last point is very important. Atanasio and Sarah. <coughs> Great job with prayer. It's just great on Wednesday. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. Uh, but I want to I want to invite you to make a massive spiritual shift in your mind in terms of your authority. Do you know what? Jesus did not send the disciples out to pray for the sick. He sent them out to heal the sick. There's a big difference. The difference is the knowledge and awareness of your authority. He said, go and heal the sick. Go and raise the dead. Go and use your authority. And it wasn't so much about us begging God to heal someone who's sick. Begging God. That's, that's an identity crisis going on right there. That's a misconception of who I am and what I'm called to be. The, the fact that I'm seated in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So as we press into 21 in prayer, 2021 in prayer, and it's been a great, great start. I pray that we spend less time begging God to do the things that he's instructed us to do. And we spend more time exercising our authority in our homes, in our families, in our communities, the way that Jesus told us to do. How? Through the word of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the blood of Jesus, through agreement with one another. That's how we exercise authority. Stop putting everything back onto God when God has put everything back onto you. He is raised from the dead. And he's left his body in the world. That's you. That's you. May he open our eyes to see this. And may God forgive us for being so dull in such an important moment in history my god you have tr you have been trusted you've been trusted in the last days the two generations the two things jesus spoke about those who were alive in the first coming and those who are alive at the second coming these, 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 these ain't, sorry but he says judgment will be very harsh for these people because you've been entrusted with a great trust but that gives me hope <coughs> god don't make no mistakes you're not a mistake. And God determines the times and the places in which we live. And he's chosen you for this moment. And he doesn't make mistakes. And in his power, we can do this. So pray with me in 2021 that you understand who you are. And you enter into the, the identity and the authority that God has given to you. As the Father sent me. So now, I am sending you. Lord, would you remove any blockage in our mind? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And whatever is wrong with my thinking, would you change it today? 
Would you renew my mind? Let me be transformed. Let us be transformed. Our homes, our churches, be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Let us be the, the, the living body of Christ, walking in authority on this planet. Lord, even as young Emmanuel has been dedicated into the kingdom, in one sense, we rededicate our lives and our predestiny into your hands. May we not resist your gracious hands. May we cooperate and be malleable, whatever that may be, so that you can have your way in us. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.